Welcome everyone again. Please sign into the chat with your first and last name, your district and your position. As you can see on the screen, we have some information that we're sharing for the Long Island Arburn regarding our webpage, our listserv, uh, how to follow us on Twitter and how to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm now going to launch a poll just so that we can all get an idea of who is participating with us today. So the poll should now be visible on your screen. So please just indicate for us what best describes your role in supporting English learners in an integrated collaborative model service delivery. And if you checked off other, just let us know what your unique role is. Maybe you already did that as you were signing in. We'd like to know who is in the room. And new participants are entering as we speak. For security reasons, we have to admit you pretty much one at a time. But as you're arriving, please sign in as well as participate in this poll. And thank you so much for being here, especially if you came back from yesterday and you would want some more. And those of you who might have signed up for multiple workshops that I'm offering, we might not have seen each other in person for a long time for many, many reasons but now reconnecting virtually with Long Island educators is really very humbling and affirming for me. I recognize so many names and I'm looking forward to spending the next hour with you. And thank you, Kelly and Krista and the entire Arburn team for reaching out to me and including me in your professional development. Oh, thank, thank you so much for being here with us. And I, I think it's one of the the silver linings, if we're looking for silver linings to our current situation, the many opportunities that have uh, been available for educators to connect and to engage in such meaningful professional development. And thank you so much for, for being, with here, being with us here and, and sharing your expertise with all of our participants. All right, so somebody mentioned that the poll is not visible anymore. So I think we should end the poll and move on with the presentation. And sorry if you missed it, it simply asked about your role in education. And when Kelly uh, shares the results, then you're going to see what the poll was about. Was okay, the, I right? shared the results, are they visible? Yes, I see them. Yes, so we have predominantly, um, K-5 ENL teachers who co-teach with K-5 classroom teachers. So that's the largest group. And we also have a lot of uh, people indicated as other. So assuming uh, different content area, teaching roles. I see somebody typing in bilingual science teacher, self-contained classroom and so forth. So thank you so much for being back here again in this online environment for more mm -hmm. workshops. So back to you, Kelly, and I will help admitting people while you are talking. Oh, great. Thank you. So um, again, my name is Kelly Cordero, and I am a resource specialist with the Long Island Arburn. And I will be moderating today's session with our presenter, Dr. Andrea Honigsfeld. But before we get into the presentation, I just want to share some of this information with you. So uh, you saw on the earlier screen how to access our website, how to follow us on Twitter. And I just want to remind you all that you should subscribe to our YouTube channel because we have several recordings of all of the virtual professional development that we've been providing during this time, lots of instructional snapshots. All of our recorded webinars can be found here, including today's webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. So. Again, we are so grateful to have with us today, Dr. Andrea Honigsfeld. And I just want to give you some of her background. So Dr. Honigsfeld is the Associate Dean and Director of the Doctoral Program in Educational Leadership for Diverse Learning Communities at Malloy College 
an incredible program. If you want to find out more about that, just stick around afterwards. Um, she was an English as a foreign language teacher in Hungary and English as a second language teacher in New York City. She taught Hungarian at New York University. Uh, Dr. Honigsfeld is an international presenter across the United States, Canada, China, Great Britain, Denmark, Sweden, the Philippines, Thailand, the United Arab Emirates. She is the author or editor of more than 20 books on education, as well as numerous chapters and research articles related to the needs of diverse learners, co-teaching, teacher collaboration, and English language and literacy strategies. So with all of these things, I can see why we're all here today, but I also want to bring to your attention the fact that Dr. Honigsfeld will be returning. So please take advantage of these other opportunities here that are upcoming. We have, a, we have two more one hour sessions that are coming up next week. And the following week, Dr. Honigsfeld will be with us for two three hour sessions and registration is currently open for all of these events. So I will put those links into the chat in just a moment, but I wanted to make sure that I shared them with you. And without taking up any more time, I want to turn it over to Dr. Honigsfeld. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can start sharing yours. Thank you very much. And I'm ready to do that right away so that we could jump into this topic that I'm very excited to be able to bring to you. And it's based on my work in the international context in the past few months. So those of you who might not have met me before, I was born and raised in Hungary. That's where the accent comes from. And here are just a couple of images in case one day you will be able to travel there again. It's definitely a beautiful place to visit. As Kelly mentioned, um, I've actually been at Molloy College for the past 20 years. For 15 years, I was coordinating and directing the master's program in TESOL, and in the past five years, the doctoral program in education, focusing on social justice and equity. And uh, these are just some of my publications. Almost all of them are co-authored and collaboratively produced. So I try to practice what I preach and do a lot of collaboration myself. So let's just start with a little warm up since we're talking about international education. In the chat box, just as a warm up, type in the most memorable country that you have ever visited or where would you like to go when we can travel again? Just type in the name of a country. Oh, I see Iceland. Oh my goodness, the first one popping up, Iceland. I was a Fulbright coloring scholar in Iceland of all places and truly, truly memorable. And so many countries, so many continents. New Zealand, definitely on my bucket list. Um, beautiful, beautiful places all over Europe. I'm seeing um, South America, Central America, Lebanon. Yes, yeah, I also visited um, Israel and um, where my husband was born. Beautiful, beautiful bucket list. Any Asian country that you could just visit, somebody said. So international education and experiences around the world really helps help us become more global citizens and a little bit more open-minded to what is going on elsewhere, even though right now we have to stay put and have to stay um, sheltered. So these pictures were taken January 2020. Yes, I was in China. Um, right before, literally the day before the news broke out here in the United States, what was going on with the breakout. I was not in the epicenter of the um, um, COVID-19 breakout. I was in Southern China, in Guangzhou, across the bay from Hong Kong. And I did training professional development around the topic of co-teaching and collaboration. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because as soon as I came home, the, um, the context within China was that they were breaking for the Lunar New Year. So no, nobody was going back to school that following week anyway. And then they kept extending the Lunar New Year break, which was supposed to be a two week uh, vacation. And I've been following very, very closely what is happening in China, what is happening in the other countries in the region. I also visited Thailand 
the year before. So I had lots of lots of international connections and I was on sabbatical. I was supposed to go to Italy in March and that never happened. So today what I'd like to share with you is uh, some successful remote learning practices in international schools. And of course also relate your own remote learning um, uh, and remote learning and remote teaching practices to these other examples. So, this is my agenda with approximate times. Those of you who were with me today and those of you who are coming back to those two other one hour sessions, this is what the session is going to look like. So I'm going to be doing an interactive Zoom presentation, inviting you a lot to participate in the chat box. And then we're going to go to a breakout room for approximately maybe 10 minutes, maybe 12 minutes. I will be checking in, seeing how the conversation is going. Please, 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 when you go into those breakout rooms and Zoom will take care of it if you're not sure how, how to do this, don't worry, you will be automatically assigned to a breakout room and you're going to have a choice task, not assigned tasks. Yesterday I assigned breakout room specific discussion prompts. This time I'm assigning um, five choices and your group is going to decide what you want to discuss. You're going to capturing your discussions on a Padlet. Again, if you were here yesterday, Arburn 1 was the code. Today is Arburn 2. And yes, I'm going to be very consistent. It's going to go to Arburn 3, 4, 5, 6. All of my Padlets will be aligned like that. Then we come back with some continued presentation and question and answers. This is what your Padlet is going to look like. And I'm going to ask Kelly to put it into the chat box as well as um, when we come closer to the breakout time, we're gonna repeat this. And if you were here yesterday, you just need to change the one to a two. But as you could notice, there are choice tasks and choose whichever topic you wish to discuss. And based on that, I'm just gonna ask Kelly to mute the participant who has a little bit of a background noise going on. So thanks again. Thank you. This is going to come a little later. And I'd also like to share with you that I use the Padlet for another reason as well. And my second reason to use the Padlet is to upload resources. So while we can put resources into the chat box, once the chat is over, then those uh, links uh, disappear. So you are going to get a copy of the PowerPoint and you're also going to get a copy or a link rather to my publications so as you could see in April, I published an article with uh, John Nordmeyer about collaboration going online and how schools in China discovered collaboration when it was all done remotely. ASCD, again, in the chat box, please type in if you've seen this, yes or no, a Y or an N. ASCD published a summer special topic issue. I see a lot of no's coming up. It's, it continues to be but the best kept secret and you do not have to be an ASCD member. I think that's one thing that turns people off that you can't read their articles, you can't read their books because you have to be a member. They made sure for equity and fair, fairness reasons that this issue is free to everybody. And the entire issue focuses on a new reality, getting remote learning right. And I had an invited article in that. And that's what I'm gonna be unpacking with you today. But you um, just so you know, Dr. Honigsfeld, we we found this at the Arburn and we incorporated this into many of our earlier webinars when we first started all of this distance learning. So we were really trying to get it out there. So I hope that more people um, do do take a look. It's amazing. Yeah, so one participant asked to put these links into the chat box. We can't really do that right now because all of these links are already on Padlet. So you only need one link, which is the Padlet link. And then when you go there, you're going to find all of these additional articles. So rather than trying to, um, you know, duplicate effort here, everything is in one place. Okay. All right. When was it released? It was released in May, I think very recently. Summer. This is the summer 2020 special report. All right. So in this, um, in my publications with John Nordmeyer, I know I cheated on Maria. Those of you who know that I always co-author with Maria and a lot of the times I co-author with Judy Dodge and also with Audrey Cohan. This time I cheated on them and I worked with John Nordmeyer, who is an international educator with WIDA. And in our articles, if I can just continue yesterday's um, theme with the letter C, 
these are the five big ideas that we extrapolated from our interviews, interactions, and many other sources from international educators, which is caring, chunking, collaborating, paying attention to culture, and changing things up. So let's go one at a time. And I'm giving lots of lots of shout outs to the international educators. A lot of these international educators are actually expats from English speaking countries. And when we, I talk about international educators, I'm thinking about international schools where the medium in, of instruction is English and most or all of the learners are uh, English as an additional EAL learners. So that's for you just to understand the context. So one of the first things that Alicia taught me who started teaching online while she got stuck in the United States and could never go back to the school in Gangzhou that I visited she said that the, one of the most important things we had to do is stay connected, take care of each other, each other as, as educators, as colleagues, uh, take care of our students that we're there, we're available to them, we're connecting with them, as well as the families. And here are some of her ideas of how she did it. Another way that Sarah and many of her colleagues internationally, wherever they ended up getting stuck, whether they were able to go back to their host countries, or they ended up staying at home, all of a sudden having a little bit more time initially, and then things of course got sped up after the Lunar New Year, they started engaging in virtual book clubs for engagement, as well as professional book studies started to spring up. And this is Erin Kent, and um, okay, this is a shameless plug, but, um, oh, somebody said that I'm frozen. Am I frozen for everybody? I you are that. not frozen from me, okay, so that may good. just be that one person. That could be, all right, I was getting a little nervous there, but it seems like most of you are, if you can hear me okay, then it must be um, uh, on your end. So please let me know if there is a problem, if I have to repeat anything, hopefully the internet will collaborate today. So basically, um, all of a sudden in this international context, the educators started uh, figuring out, okay, when we go back to school, we talked about it yesterday, that we're not going back to the old ways, that there's gonna be a new normal. And one thing I can very happily report to you that one new way is that a lot of international educators started to invest time and effort into it. How are we gonna be more collaborative when we go back? And WeChat is in the, um, do they use WeChat in Korea? I'm not sure, but they do use that in China extensively as a way of communicating. So my first chat question, how do you, how have you been taking care of each other during COVID-19? What have you done? Both self-care, each other, professionally, personally. So yoga, yes, yeah, me too. Reaching out more, regularly checking in, yes staying in touch with each other, going for walks, video chatting, calling, checking in. Absolutely, so you're, many of you are sharing both personal uh, ways of taking care of yourself, taking care of each other, meditation, mindfulness, bicycle, so exercise. It, it's really, really important, even though it has always been important that we, how can we take care of others if we don't take care of ourselves? So this idea of operating in times of crisis really has to be carefully considered, considering what can we do to, to get out positive on the other end. Yes, yes, thank you so much for many of your comments. So the second finding that uh, John and I summarized as plan to collaborate and collaborate to plan. And of course, this is a little bit of playing on words, but I think the one big discovery that we had that before COVID-19, um, many teachers, I think most of us, of course, continue to appreciate autonomy and closing our classrooms doors and it's, it's my class, my cur curriculum, my kids. But in this new context, more and more teachers recognize that we really can do this alone. It's just way too challenging. And uh, John and I, both in the international context and in the U.S. context, we have both um, experienced this almost seismic shift to developing a more collaborative mindset. And part of that collaborative mindset was also this idea of vulnerability, that we are going to be talking about what we don't know, because there's so many things that we don't know, and we don't even know what we don't know, because this is so new. We could never say, oh, um, we have never done it this way. Let's just go back the way we've always done things. Okay, so in this collaborative um, context, 
we've seen, especially in the Chinese schools that I supported, that teachers are rediscovering and also reconstructing one of those co-planning protocols that in New York State you might have heard from me, which is the pre-planning, co-planning, and post-planning. But this time in remote learning, it's going to look quite different because the pre-planning might focus on just how are we even going to meet? What are gonna be some norms for us to communicate? And then the co-planning will focus on just the bare minimum. Okay, what are we gonna teach? How are we going to assess it? And what are some key learning experiences that we want to create for our students? And then a lot more time is spent in that post-planning when we divide and conquer and we figure out, you do this, I do that. So the co-planning protocol still holds but now uh, adjusting it slightly differently to the context. And here is one example from South Korea from Lindsay Cool, who shows examples of what she's been creating, lots of lots of different forms of scaffolds, as you, keep, as you could see, even if it's smaller on your screen, very colorful, at the same time accessible, whether it is focusing on transitional words or sentence frames and so forth. And here is the, uh, is a, ex the example from um, the school that I visited in January and then I stayed in touch with them. And uh, this is one of the educators, Will Arnold, uh, sharing with me who said that now co-planning is happening not just across three educators, which was already hard enough, but now across three continents and three time zones. Uh, Will is in Australia. Um, Leah is in, uh, one of them was able to remain in China and one was in the United States. So these are his own words who said, we, were, we have, why does it work for us now to continue to co-plan, even though it is so challenging because as you could see, they're in different continents, different time zones. Well, these are his um, arguments why this still continues to work. They have a wealth of trust already to draw, draw on. So this was already a solid team. They find ways to use online tools, so replacing face-to-face -face communication, and also the most important is that shared commitment, we're here for the kids. And this is the co-planning template that they designed. And it kept getting uh, revised and revised, and at one point in February, uh, Will shared this with me because, I, as I mentioned to you, I kept following and checking in with everybody. I was actually seriously worried about them that any of those wonderful educators I met just a few weeks be before might fall ill. And uh, it was just a devastating time for me to keep watching what was emerging in Asia when we were not yet taking that seriously enough here in the United States. So anyway, you could just see a little bit of a, a screenshot here, what they were trying to do, focusing on vocabulary skills, objectives, um, uh, one week at a glance um, idea, and who does what then crossed out, who already finished um, different materials. So if you have engaged in collaborative planning in the chat box, please share. How? How did you plan? How do you plan collaboratively? What are some of your FaceTime? I see some answers are coming in. Your technology tools are popping up. Yes. And all of these tools were already available to us before, obviously, before COVID-19 but now they became our primary way of connecting with each other. And many of you are listing multiple tools. So just recognizing that we have the Google Docs, the Google Slides, and then Zoom and text and phone calls and so forth. Yes, so thank you so much. All right, the third, the third finding from our um, interviews and interactions with the international educators was, which is very, very interesting, take a look at the language, actually looking at an asset-based approach, that silver lining that Kelly also mentioned before, that yes, we could call this remote learning, distance learning, e-learning, virtual classrooms, but many of these educators started to look at how can we leverage teaching and learning from home as an asset rather than as a problem that obviously um, we are all facing, we are isolated physically, but where are we can be also part of the curriculum. So the four big ideas here were culturally sustaining pedagogy, so tapping into the cultures of the children, the cultural identities, authentic experiences for the kids so that they would be motivated, place-based learning, which is very interesting. I uploaded a couple of resources on 
um, Padlet about it, just in case you are not very familiar with place-based learning. And finally, fonts of knowledge and fonts of identity. And by the way, when I put, where I put the purple hearts, those two are upcoming topics that I'm going to be addressing um, within the context of this Arburn series. So I'm gonna have a workshop on culturally sustaining pedagogy within the remote learning context, as well as authentic experiences. So digging a lot deeper into that. Here I have only a couple of examples for you. So what place-based education is, is recognizing that wherever you are, whatever time, wherever you are finding yourself, there is a community and the world around you that could be part of the curriculum. And here is a beautiful example from Shenzhen, China, where uh, what they call it is a COVID-19 art from recycled school supplies. I mean, this is just absolutely gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous what the kids um, created. Here is another one. Uh, Megan Wilson asked um, her students to video themselves and put just upload a little bit of a video. How do they stay healthy? And each of the children just had a little five second video about what do they do, both showcasing um, home life and an important part of staying healthy and staying well in these difficult times, as well as for the kids to be able to see each other. And as much as they miss each other's faces, see that shared experience of trying to do some exercise and stay healthy. And this is another absolute favorite example of mine. This is also hyperlinked already for you on a Padlet, where again, Megan from China turned uh, service as curriculum and included that uh, in their advocacy unit, a five week online unit on helping survive COVID-19. It was as authentic as it gets and if you go to that website, you're gonna find posters and infographics and videos and a whole range of project-based um, outcomes that the students produced. So, oh, I guess I forgot to put in a, a little question here. So type in a little bit, in what ways do you take an asset-based approach or have you taken an asset-based approach during COVID-19 um, times? I meant to put in a little chat call out there so you could just do that now just type in what have you done that tapped into your students cultural identities so think about now for instructional purposes you ask students to take so i assume you see that you ask them to take pictures of themselves or take nature hikes so you invited them into that kind of place-based education Oh, working student hours. Wow. Okay. Assigning articles based on what's happening. Flipgrid is really, really fabulous. Seeing each other, that oral rehearsal. I think a lot of answers are coming in. Uh, the spirit weeks, the virtual spirit weeks, what the kids were asked to write about. The hometown hero writing letters. Oh my gosh, I remember my fourth grader had to do that too. And we wrote and mailed a letter to the uh, local hospital emergency room. So making, making learning authentic, uh, real, so that rather than schooling, trying to bring the school into the classroom, we were trying to bring learning into the home. Okay, so let's continue. The next is thinking in chunks, linking lessons, resources, and communication. This was a really, really important part of what we found within the international context. And um, some of these practices, of course, have already been with us. This is nothing new when we want to chunk and break it down into meaningful, manageable learning experiences. But in an online or remote learning context, it was even more important for these educators. So connecting and linking multiple lessons, that kind of spiral kind of teaching that the resources have to be connected and aligned, multiple meaningful ways of communicating with um, the students and the families was also very, very important. And of course, giving students a bird's eye view of what to expect, what's coming up next week and so forth. Now there is a Flipgrid link the Flipgrid that I am referring to is actually something you're going to see in a moment, but I'll share that with you. So um, here is a bird's eye view. And what I really appreciated seeing this from Tan Huynh from Vietnam 
is that some of the things are optional. So building in choices, but at the same time, there is clarity, the chunking, as well as the clear communication with hyperlinking. This is what you're gonna to do today. This is what you're gonna do only for 20 minutes. You're gonna do this, you're gonna do this, do this, and you're gonna do that. And mapping it out for the students. Yes, this is a lot of work upfront. No kidding about that. If you just think about the Padlet that I designed for you for this one hour workshop, I feel it. That is so much more planning when you do this kind of teaching, but then it pays off because of the participation. All right, so here is, I'm taking you back now to China, to Will Arnold's classroom, where uh, first time the students got some sentence frames, the second time they got a model as well. So chunking it, breaking it down, making one single task manageable, accessible, and then reflecting on that task. How did you solve this quadratic equation and how can you think about that mathematically using English is what modeled here. So. My question to you, how do you chunk? How do you connect? How do you communicate? Type in, I think some of you already started typing in. Day by day view, yes. Writing activities that were, um, thank you Antonia, 10 positive things and activities, hyperdocs three days at a time, week by week. So trying to look at a unit of study and thinking, of learning in a much larger context, building block lessons, screencastify. So many of you are typing in um, technology tools as well that you were using to be able to chunk and connect and, and communicate with your students. All right. And then the final finding that we found was that one size does not fit all. And we could certainly recognize in the US context as well that English learners just come from such different backgrounds, languages, cultures, abilities, identities in the United States context. Of course, we have a tremendous variety of uh, socioeconomic levels as well, um, not to mention linguistic and neurodiversity. So what you see down here, this is Lindsay Cool's way of trying to do a side-by-side -side ways of presenting um, the lesson and just close the door. Okay. And uh, sorry, there's a lot of movement, I think. This is, this is the kind of online learning that you're also experiencing. A lot of action, a lot of movement in your own home when you teach from home. And so what she did here, just to come back to what you're looking at, the uh, illustration there is two different ways of communicating and presenting the material for different levels of language proficiencies. And, and Elvis, thank you for your comment. Overview of the chapter, chunking day by day. Okay, and as I mentioned to you, the Flipgrid. So I was uh, part of the original very first launching team of this Flipgrid. You could see that the oldest Flipgrid is at the bottom. And we connected with 34 educators. These Flipgrid um, posts have over 5,000 views, 90 hours of shared learning, 90 seconds at a time, which is quite remarkable. So what's happening here is educators from around the world who are part of this WIDA consortium around international schooling shared their, their four topics, their successes, their struggles, their success stories, and so forth. So, and this is in the public domain, meaning you do not have to be a WIDA global educator. And that's the link, and it's also on your Padlet. So if you just want to listen in, you want to hear what people are experiencing in Canada as opposed to in Australia or Korea, you could browse around and listen to these, these people, what they have to say about um, online learning. And then a couple of other um, takeaways from this experience. Uh, this was really, really big. After about three or four weeks, when they knew that this is not gonna end suddenly. This is not uh, a fast turnaround. So Tan generously shared his Pomodoro method, which is that very intense work time, and then just taking a break, that really literally walking away from everything and whatever, doing some push-ups or walking around um, your backyard or doing something just to stay sane and, and keep um, your momentum going. And then Tan also shared this virtual school schedule that he developed, where as you could see, this is again, not prescriptive, but this is something that worked for him. 
and I appreciated seeing a large chunk of the day, of course, spent with the students and another large chunk of the day spent um, with the background work that he really had to do lesson planning and teacher collaboration and he had to take care of himself. That kind of a um, self-care right in there. And then coming back to the student work, what the students worked on during the day so that between two and three, he was able to give feedback to the students and having a hard stop at 3.30, otherwise the entire day could have gotten hijacked by doing this kind of teaching. All right, so the chat, how do you individualize your response to the COVID-19 conditions? The topic here was one size does not fit all. In what way were you approaching the COVID-19 COVID conditions in a unique way? Okay. One-on-one -on -one video chats, I really appreciate that. Just having really that focused time with some people. I appreciate it, Nadia, you said just turn the computer off. You really need to be a little bit away from it, not to be too hard on yourself. Thank you, Stephanie, for bringing that in here. Taking breaks, definitely. And if we're going back into this kind of a, or a hybrid setup, which is now being discussed, the same idea, how to create a schedule, how to create a way of maintaining um, this kind of teaching. Watch comedy, all right, <laughs> whatever works, absolutely. All right, thank you so much. So we're doing pretty well, look at that, 235 as planned. You are now going into your breakout rooms. So I am, mm, Kelly, I cannot see the breakout room. So I think you okay. will- Okay, so I can, do you host. want me to make you the host now? Yes, please. Okay. So those of you who were not here yesterday, wait for it in a moment. You're gonna be invited into a breakout room and please accept the invitation into the breakout room. Oh, and this is not Arburn one. This is Arburn two. Oh my goodness. So Kelly. Okay, I'm going to quickly in the chat, I'm going to put the link again. Yes, I just copied and pasted it from yesterday. There we and go. In fact, it should have been Arburn two. So I'm actually gonna go there myself so you could see. This is what you should have open now. If it looks like this, like this animal print in the background, then you are in the right place. Yes, good, all right. So everybody's gonna be there for the next 10 to 12 minutes. You're gonna have five. Oh, somebody's answering already, very good. You have five choice tasks, as well as all the additional resources I promised are already here. And the PowerPoint is gonna go up here after the session is over. So because it's a choice board, I'm going to invite you in your own breakout rooms to quickly decide what you want to discuss and maximize the time that you have. So right now, I'm going to assign you to breakout rooms. Because of the size of the uh, group, we actually have, I decided that I'm going to do 15 groups today. So you have a little bit of a smaller um, group size and seven to eight people. Please turn on your microphones. Please turn on your videos. You could do screen sharing and definitely use this time to talk to each other. Okay, here we go. From the breakout rooms. So, we are going to reconvene. I have a few more things I'd like to share with you because they actually reopened. So the situation got good enough that uh, most of these schools reopened in May. Some of them in um, Taiwan, they actually reopened only after about a few weeks of being closed. And then they closed off very quickly again. So there was a lot of back and forth. And I'd like to take you on a picture walk of what reopening looked like and then leave a couple of minutes for questions and answers as well at the end. I saw that you were very active on Padlet. There are lots of lots of posts. I stopped in a couple of rooms. I did not have a chance to go around and visit all of you because there were some troubleshooting that I had to address. But it seems like most of our participants are back here in the main room. We still have a couple of people who have not rejoined the large group, but I'm going to start sharing um, with you. Okay. So reopening. Again, I'm gonna take you back to time. 
who is a wonderful educator and has a very active Twitter presence as well as a blog. So this is an example from his classroom about physically distant collaboration in the classroom after reopening. So the kids are physically distanced. They're wearing their masks and they're using uh, technology. So it's a hybrid approach sort of because we are no longer or they are no longer um, at home yet the social distancing, the physical distancing is still going to happen. Yet he really wants the kids to collaborate and interact and develop language like that. This is another very, very interesting way that he documented. Now, this is not prescriptive. It's not going to look like this in the United States. But this is what they figured out in Vietnam, and we might be going this way, which is starting on Monday, that was their reopening day, how to do staggered dismissal time. Please take a look at that. Look at that, an hour, 20 minutes to pick up all the kids. So it's a huge shift. A strict diagram, the dots, the lines, who stands where, who does what. The lunchroom, the blue dots indicate where you can sit and the red taped up line that you cannot sit on that side of the uh, lunch table because of WHO regulations of the air flowing if you talk, if you breathe in one direction. The library was all of a sudden transformed into this, um, what does this remind you of? Um, checkers? Yes, quite different. Yes, it is really happening in Vietnam. I can't make this stuff up. Yes, somebody's asking, is it really happening? Yeah, these are all authentic pictures from Tan Huyn School. This the, here is Tan. This is the way he went back. This is his classroom rearranged. He's wearing a mask and having a happy face on his mask. Friends, now I'm going to take you around the world. Um, just, just enjoy the tour and see classrooms. These are not my personal contacts. I have more pictures from personal contacts. These pictures I have extracted from various articles, and those articles will be embedded in your PowerPoint as well. In Germany, inside and outside classroom. There's a lot of outdoor education, a lot of marking. This is from Canada, and when you get the PowerPoint, then you are going to, um, hype, you can hype, uh, sorry, click on these links, and you could actually read the full articles. I just wanted to give you a picture walk. In Korea, again, take a look at the dividers. And in South Korea, again, the plastic shields and the masks. And in Canada, this was actually quite an interesting Twitter link that I discovered. I have a lot of contacts in Canada, not this educator directly, just a, a Twitter pal. And how to turn distance learn, I mean, um, keeping a physical distance into a game or into an activity for the kids. These are some more images from Canada, restructuring, reorganizing, and lots of lots of outdoor education. Take a look at that little one, trying for that preschool child to understand. Some of it is, of course, heartbreaking. These are very, very difficult times. Yeah, yeah. So, um, more from Denmark, lots of outdoor education. Look at the lining of the kids, letting the kids in one at a time. Washing hands along. This was a New York Times article just a few weeks ago, again from Denmark. Denmark reopened in uh, April. Many Asian countries reopened in May. So again, China, Denmark, Japan, another article for you. Every hour the kids had to wash hands. Everybody's wearing masks. And here is my friend Lindsay from South Korea. Uh, this was her first day back that she documented, and um, I especially appreciate the part about asking the kids, what do you wish your parents would know about your experience? So just, just again, paying attention to that social emotional piece. This is not easy on us educators, and of course, we have to have that empathy of what does it feel like for our kids. So what is next for going to be looking like for us, the disinfection, the, the pacing? and all of these different um, realities that we are waiting to happen. And finally, one more article that was truly very eye-opening for me, not from the international context, I'm bringing you back to the United States and to New York now. Uh, again, please read this article, really, really very powerful, because the authors of the article interviewed students, not English learners, but maybe we can learn from what these students have to say. These are the four things that they were 
hungry for, they were hoping for. High touch learning, more collaboration, more interaction, greater interactivity, again, games, game-like activities, simulations, maybe virtual field trips, interactive videos, and fewer worksheets. Personalized learning, a range of activities that address students' skills, abilities, interests, and home situations. Choice boards, I try to model that for you. Personalized learning pathways to individual projects. And finally, more challenging activities, rather than getting stuck on that one, one more worksheet, one more, who is gonna remember what's on that worksheet? Instead, projects, activities that address real world challenges. And this is what I'm going to pick up on when you, if you come back to my um, authentic learning um, workshop. So I think that concludes what I planned. So now I'm going to stop the share and invite all of you to turn on your videos. I'd love to see you and just to say hello virtually. And uh, please do put in your questions in your uh, chat room. I think there is a question about the evaluation. That is a question for Kelly. So I think Kelly is gonna take care of any kind of follow-up. I would love to hear your feedback. I think we're all um, you know, flying this plane as we are, or we're building the plane and we're flying it at the same time. I'm figuring out myself how to, um, how to just do these kinds of professional development sessions virtually. And your feedback is so important to me. Where do you get the PowerPoint? So the PowerPoint is going to be on the um, Padlet link. That's why I said you, all you need is a one-stop shopping here. You get the Padlet link. You were all on Padlet, I think, right? So if you were here yesterday, then, um, okay, here we go. I put in the Padlet link again. Kelly is already sharing her screen. So it's, the PowerPoint is not there yet. And knowing how many pictures I have, I know that I might have to break this PowerPoint into two pieces, meaning the first section and then the reopening, because it was just a lot of pictures. And yes, thank you for the feedback right away that you appreciated the breakout rooms. Um, they are a little bit more meaningful when I have a two hour session or three hour session. So when you come back for the three hour session, uh, if you do, we just opened it up to 75 people because it, it uh, closed off already at um, 50. So if you come back, there will be even more interaction. So any more questions? We have a couple of minutes left. Yeah, it is fascinating. Thank you, Jackie, for pointing out. It's just really fascinating. We have to look to what other countries are doing and figuring out what, what is the best that we can borrow from that. Here's a good question. How do you prepare students and families for this kind of challenge? And I had a brief conversation with my students the end of school last year, and they were worried about the school would be what it would look like due to safety routines. Um, well, how do you prepare them? Actually, the, the Edutopia article has additional pieces there, which is what kind of training we're going to have to do. And some of this is the cognitive modeling, some of this is the technology and the social emotional. So go back to that article that is, um, if it's not hyperlinked yet, everything is hyperlinked either in the Padlet or in the PowerPoint. But I'm going to share that article with you so that you can um, read the entire article because one section of the article is specifically addressing that question, which is what has to happen. And maybe you have to do that for the first two weeks and um, less is more and doing, doing less, jumping a little later into the curriculum, but making sure that you set the students up for success. And here is the link. I sent it to, um, oh, I sent it to somebody privately by accident. Sorry, Antonia, I'm sharing it with everybody and not just with you. Here we go. I don't know how that happened. Here it is for everybody. So the Edutopia article, which has a specific section on what students said, what were the survey results, that's when they asked for the high touch learning, the interactivity, the, the game-like activities. One question was on how teachers could be better prepared. And the final question was with a set of strategies, how we can help students be better prepared. 
and somebody said that the um, uh, PowerPoint does not open easily. No, it does not. It's not going to open within Padlet. Download it and save it on your computer. But what I can try to do with this one, because this is going to be even more, is um, we are going to be saving the, the um, link on Google. So that way you can definitely open it. And I see some comments about uh, uh, events who are emotionally disturbed and have other special needs. Please forgive me, that is not my area of expertise to uh, special education classrooms and behavior challenging because my background is in um, integrated education and English as a new language. So again, that's my limitation and I'm showing my vulnerability. I certainly don't have and do not claim to have all the answers. And um, since this workshop series is sponsored by Long Island Arburn, my focus and my angle and my expertise is on English learners and English language education. So I hope that similar sessions will be available to educators who work with students with disabilities as well. Did I miss any questions? Uh, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. I, I forgot to do the evaluation yesterday. So what, what should I do? Uh, Kelly, I think I'm going to let you answer any questions related to uh, participation, evaluation. So I'm going to give it back to you. And okay. everybody, so, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. If you can all see my screen, I'm sharing the My Learning Plan screen that you can return to to provide your feedback. You can see where there is a uh, drop down menu where you can access the evaluation form and also to confirm your attendance. So again, if you did not already, you can sign into the chat with your first and last name and your district so we can verify your attendance. But that evaluation piece is really very important to us because we rely on your feedback to, to decide what we're going to be offering in the future, to decide what you want to see more of. So we really do try to respond to, to your needs and the feedback that you provide. So yes, please do, if you registered on my learning plan, return there after this session to complete that evaluation. And if you have any questions on that, you can always um, contact me directly. I will throw my email into the chat in case you need it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And there's my email. And I just want to really take this opportunity again to thank Dr. Honigsfeld for being here with us. Thank you. And I'm going to just go back here and make sure that you have this information before you leave that there are four more sessions coming up with Dr. Honigsfeld. The two sessions next week are one hour sessions and the following week, uh, Dr. Honigsfeld is offering two three hour sessions with us. So you see the topics there. Those are the registration links and you will find all of these in our catalog on my learning plan. But Dr. Honigsfeld, thank you so much for being with us here today. We really appreciate all that you shared with us. Thank you. This is um, truly my pleasure. Somebody's asking if the three hour classes will be on YouTube later. I'm not sure maybe segments we can take because I'm gonna make the three hour ones more interactive. Obviously, mm -hmm. even the time you were listening to me for about 30, 35 minutes and then we broke up. It's, it's hard to maintain attention. I don't know if anybody would be watching the three hour recording, honestly, but uh, just like today, we can, I don't know if Kelly is going to be co-facilitating with me, but we could capture segments of it. And then when you work in your workout rooms, I mean, sorry, we, you need that to work out too, but breakout rooms, then um, those segments are not recorded because that way people feel more comfortable mm -hmm. having uh, an open professional conversation. Right. And if you visit our YouTube channel, you'll see that for most of the webinars that we have offered, we do have the recording in its entirety, but then we also do offer just shorter versions. So we clip out, you know, maybe eight to 10 minute chunks so they're a little more digestible and, and user-friendly. So you can just 
focus on one particular topic that's offered within a webinar. So you, you have that choice to either view a webinar in its entirety or just to focus on one particular area and we'll caption it so that you can see more clearly uh, what was covered within those shorter segments. Thank you. So if there are no other questions for me, I wanted to thank Armour and especially Krista and Kelly for supporting this series. I'm very excited to be able to do uh, something more in the community. And I see that there are many upstate educators participating mm -hmm. as well. So thank you for being here virtually. And I hope to see many of you next week and the week after. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye.